The FAR exam is full of calculations. So if you want to pass the exam, you need to master these key formulas that we're going to talk about in this video. Make sure you memorize each of these formulas and see how the numbers that we talk about apply to each example. So let's jump in with allowance for doubtful accounts. So for any balance sheet account, we need to ask what increases this account and what decreases this account. So with allowance for doubtful accounts, what increases this account? When we initially estimate our bad debt, we debit bad debt expense and credit allowance for doubtful accounts. This increases allowance for doubtful accounts. And then when we write off AR as uncollectible, we decrease allowance for doubtful accounts. So make sure you know what increases it and decreases allowance for doubtful accounts. So here we have the formula for allowance for doubtful accounts. So imagine that our beginning balance is 5,000, our ending balance is 6,000, and we've written off 1,000. So then we could solve for our bad debt expense here. It would therefore be 2,000 because it'd be 5,000 plus 2,000 minus 1,000 equals 6,000. So I wanna make sure that you're practicing solving for X when it comes to these types of questions. So next you wanna make sure that you know about what increases inventory and decreases inventory. So you have beginning inventory and then you purchase new inventory. So credit, cash, debit, inventory. And then you sell the inventory, which is debit cost of goods sold expense and credit inventory. So this is the formula for your inventory balance. So we have beginning inventory plus purchases minus cost of goods sold equals ending inventory. So we could be given beginning inventory and purchases and the ending inventory and then have to solve for cost of goods sold by solving for X. Next, you want to make sure you understand straight line depreciation and double declining depreciation. With straight line depreciation, you first subtract out your salvage value and then evenly divide it over the useful life. But with double declining depreciation, we ignore the salvage value and we're going to depreciate it twice as fast. So if you imagine a five year useful life asset, then in the first year of double declining, instead of depreciating at 20%, we would depreciate it by 40%. So now let's imagine this example of double declining depreciation. We have a $100,000 vehicle with a five year useful life. So in the first year, we're gonna take the full 100,000 and we're going to multiply it by one over five times two or 40%, 0.4. So year one depreciation is 40,000. The year one ending balance of the asset is 60,000. So then next year we take 60,000 times 40%, and year two depreciation is 24,000. Therefore, the year two ending balance would be 36,000, and we would repeat this process for all five years. After having helped countless students to pass their exams, I found the most efficient way to explain each CPA concept. And with that, I created my full CPA exam video course. So in a fraction of the time, you can master each CPA concept and fully understand it to get ready for your exam. Next, you need to know the key formulas for bond accounting. First, we have the initial bond recording. So to find the present value of the bond, we take the present value of the bond payments and of the face value. So then you have your bond payable for the full face value and then either a discount or a premium. So for the formulas, you need to know interest expense, which is your effective rate times your carrying value of your bond. Next, you need to know your cash paid, which is your stated rate times the face value of the bond. The amortization of your discount or premium is the difference between your interest expense and your cash paid. So then over time, your discount or premium amortizes, and at the end of the bond's life, you end up back at the full face value. So make sure you memorize these bond formulas. Next, we have a few rules for the cash flow statement. These are rules for the operating activities section. So you're always going to add back depreciation expense. If you have the gain on a sale of an asset, you're going to subtract it out. And if you have a loss on the sale of the asset, you're going to add it back. And then when you think about your current assets and current liabilities, when your current assets increase, your cash flow decreases. So they have an inverse relationship. When your current liabilities increase, your cash flow increases. So they have a positive correlative relationship. The next important formula to know is basic earnings per share. 
net income minus preferred dividends divided by the weighted average common shares. So this is key for you to understand. And now let's think about how to calculate the average number of common shares. So let's consider this example. We have a beginning balance of 100,000 shares. Since they're in effect as of January 1st, they count for 12 out of 12 months. So we count the full 100,000. Then imagine that we issue 50,000 shares on July 1st. So we're only going to count six out of 12, so half of those, 25,000. Then August 1st, we buy 20,000 treasury shares. So they're only in effect August, September, October, November, December for these five out of 12 months. So we multiply five over 12 times negative 20,000. And then we have a two for one stock split. So all we do is we take the balance before the stock split and then add that to the total shares. So then our ending balance is 233,333. So with that, we've gone through all the major FAR formulas that you need to master. Make sure you download the PDF of these formulas so you can practice with them. Thanks so much.